forward here. <laughs> Very official. That was official. <laughs> yes. And you're in Toronto? Um, so I'm from Toronto. I'm from Toronto. Um, okay. grew up like midtown Toronto. Um, and I just graduated from Queens. Um, nice. Queen's University. I'm currently living in Kingston, though, um, continuing on with my work as it would be very difficult to find another position in this pandemic at home. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm in Kingston currently. Um, but yeah, from Toronto. <laughs> so you're slowly moving westward and within about three or four other moves, we'll see you here in Denver. <laughs> uh, maybe, who knows? Maybe yeah. one day. Um, all right, should we get started? Yes. Okay, amazing. So the first question that I have for you is, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came into this field of work? Yes. Um, I got interested in the field of child abuse when I was a medical student. Uh, and that was uh, 54 years ago. Uh, in March of 1967, there was a professor of pediatrics at the University of Colorado uh, School of Medicine, whose name was Henry Kemp, K-E-M-P-E. -E. And he came to New York and gave a lecture called The Battered Child Syndrome. And I was on pediatrics at the time, I heard his talk. Henry actually happened to be a friend of my father also. My father was a pediatrician and they did work on vaccines. Uh, Henry was working on smallpox vaccine. My father was working on measles vaccine. But Henry's other interest was battered children. And he was the one who wrote the paper that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1962 called the Battered Child Syndrome. Now, abuse has been around for centuries, uh, but pretty much ignored. And it was Henry's paper that really brought attention to the problem, not only in the US, but in Canada and around the world. He was such an amazing uh, person, uh, a dynamic lecturer and uh, just wonderful man uh, that I decided when it came time for me to leave medical school and go do an internship in pediatrics that I wanted to go to Colorado. Uh, my wife at the time said, I thought you were gonna be a cardiologist in Connecticut. And I said, well, I think I've changed my mind. <laughs> anyway, uh, long story short, uh, cause I know we don't have much time, but I came to Colorado for my internship and residency in 1968, uh, worked with Henry and uh, had such a good experience here. Actually, my wife and I both did. Uh, that after spending two years in the service, uh, I came back to Colorado in 1973. I had a number of cases uh, where children had been abused and uh, Henry and another man named Ray Helfer sort of taught me how to be very calm and uh, caring and dispassionate about talking with parents of abused children. Uh, first of all, it isn't always the parents who abuse the children and they may have no idea. So we really can't accuse anybody or do things. So I learned a lot and I was comfortable with it. Uh, medicine is an interesting field as, is, as are all fields. You find things that depress you and you find things that you're comfortable dealing with. In the 1960s, I was very depressed about cancer because all of the three and four year old children who came to my pediatric ward with leukemia died. And I wondered how could anybody do that work? Um, but of course there were people who were interested in immunology and therapeutics 
and we're interested in the challenge of trying to keep children uh, alive and eventually prevent cancer. Uh, and they did that. 50 years later, they've done that. Three-year-olds with leukemia, 95% of them live now forever. And I was always interested in human behavior. Uh, and whenever I saw a child who had been abused, I was always interested in what was it that led to that? What was it that led to that problem? Uh, so anyhow, I was, uh, that's when I got interested in it. And then uh, I came back to the faculty from 1973 to 1980. Uh, and in 1980, I, and I was doing general pediatrics and teaching physician assistants and nurse practitioners and medical students and residents. And then I did rural health for a while. I spent time all over Colorado from 77 to 80. And in 1980, I got a something called a health policy fellowship. And that health policy fellowship uh, took me to Washington to work in Congress for a year. Before I left Colorado, uh, Henry, who had started the National Center for the Prevention and Treatment of Child Abuse and Neglect in Denver, in our Department of Pediatrics, he had had two heart attacks and he was gonna retire and move to Hawaii. And he said to me before I left for Washington, uh, I know you, uh, Dick, if you don't have something different to do than rural health, you're going to get infected with Potomac fever virus and stay in Congress for the rest of your career. I need you to direct my child abuse center. And I had never been able to say no to Henry. So I said, yes. Um, and by the way, he was right. If I hadn't made the commitment to him to come back to Denver in 1981, I'd probably still be in Washington uh, because it was an addicting uh, time. But I came back to Denver in 1981 and all of a sudden I was a national and international expert in child abuse because I was directing the National Center. So I figured I better learn something about it. That's really how I got involved in it. Well, that's an amazing story. Um, I can't believe how long you've, I guess, been this director or part of, um, I guess, history in the making for childhood abuse and neglect. So congratulations to you. And thank you so much for all that you do for all the children around the world. Thank you. It's, it's been an interesting time because uh, I've now been in pediatrics over 50 years. And all of the areas such as leukemia and diabetes and meningitis uh, and all of the illnesses that I took care of that were very serious and either seriously harmed or killed children back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, they're all better. And progress has been made in every one of those areas except in child abuse, where 50 years later, there's still five children a day, we think, in the US uh, who die every day of abuse. And it's the one area of child health uh, that I noticed after 50 years in pediatrics, uh, we were stuck. And that's actually why uh, I decided with Lori that we were going to start the National Foundation to End Child Abuse and Neglect. Well, it's a great story. I'm so glad that you two were able to connect forces and tackle this huge problem. So thank you so much. Um, okay, I guess you pretty much answered my next question, which was what inspired you to become the co-founder of EndCan, um, which I guess you just explained. So we'll move on to the next question, which is, you explain that a goal of yours is to help move child abuse from being seen solely as a social and legal issue to also a health, public and mental health issue. What do you believe is the importance of this? Well, 
uh, as again, as I look at uh, what is it that's made a difference uh, in the health and well-being of not just children but adults over the last half century, uh, it's been because there has been research, training, uh, prevention, and most important, advocacy by the parents or the children or adults who've had the condition to try to make it better. So when I was in the fifth grade, my seatmate to, in our little twin desks to the left was a guy named Bruce Campbell. And one day Bruce wasn't there uh, and he didn't come back. And three weeks later, we visited him uh, in Bellevue Hospital in New York uh, and he was in an iron lung. He got polio. Uh, at that time in the early fifties, the mothers of America who were very worried about their children started what they called the Mother's March of Dimes. And I watched over the last 50 years, the March of Dimes raise money and advocate uh, for the eradication of first polio, which happened, we don't see polio anymore. And that's because they funded research for Jonas Salk and for Albert Sabin uh, and uh, move them to birth defects and now they're working on prematurity. Uh, I've watched the parents of a seven-year-old girl who had juvenile diabetes in 1970 uh, start a, a center here in Colorado called the Barbara Davis Center, uh, which has solely been focused on research and the care of children with type one diabetes and the enormous success they've had. And everywhere you look, there are there is literally a not-for-profit organization that raises money for every adult and pediatric disease, every organ of the body. We have the American Heart Association, the Lung Association, the Liver Association, the Kidney Association. I mean, you go through all the skin, epidermalysis. There are hundreds and hundreds and they've all made progress. And when you look around, there's nothing in child abuse. And so, and because we deal with abuse as a social, have dealt with it primarily as a social and legal issue. And that's actually because in the 1960s and 70s, physicians and other health people weren't interested in the area. They thought it was a social problem. Uh, when Henry presented his paper to a thousand pediatricians in 1961, there were no questions and they all walked out of the room silently and said, not in my practice, that wouldn't happen here. That's just poor people or other people. Well, it's not. Uh, and one of the reasons uh, I know it's not is because in the 1970s, we rediscovered sexual abuse as an issue. And sexual abuse is clearly an issue that crosses all lines. Uh, and that's in the 80s, what Laurie experienced. And what Laurie and I realized was, uh, and she I'm sure said this in her interview, if she, uh, if the person who kidnapped and abused her, had gotten the help when he was a three-year-old that she got when she was a three-year-old, she wouldn't have needed the help when she was a three-year-old. And again, maybe it's a pediatric perspective because I spent a lot of time walking around newborn nurseries uh, and taking care of newborn babies who are unbelievably cute and innocent but as you walk around that nursery, you sort of wonder to yourself, what's this little boy or little girl's trajectory going to be? Are they heading toward um, what we saw in the inauguration of our new president on Monday with a 20-year-old young woman who is our 
young poet uh, who did an, a, was an amazingly creative individual, uh, or uh, are they going to be someone like the individuals who rushed our capital uh, and are, are angry and violent uh, and you, you just wonder that when you look and you realize some of that is probably, there's probably some genetic pre predisposition and it depends a whole lot on how they're cared for and how they learn to care for others. So uh, I have no idea what your question was now uh, and I'm just sort of rambling here uh, and wandering, uh, but we realized that there was no such thing for abuse because everyone thinks it's someone else's problem. And the other thing is, there has been so much shame and so much stigma uh, that those who've been abused, the vast majority of whom will survive it and will do well, uh, or even transcend it the way Lori has, uh, never talk about it. When I was growing up in the 1950s, I had an aunt with breast cancer. Nobody ever talked about it. It was a secret because it, it, there was shame with it. How could, you, how could you talk about a woman's breast with cancer in it in the 1950s? It wasn't done and the family never said a word. Similarly, I had an individual in my extended family who sexually abused the girls in our extended family and nobody ever talked about it. And it wasn't until the 1980s when I was doing this work that I realized uh, that I had a grandparent who was an abuser and nobody talked about it. Not the young women in the family who were abused by him, not my aunts and uncles and parents who knew about it, but never talked about it. And so the burden of all of that falls on the child who's victimized. And that's just not right. Uh, how they survive it uh, is with a lot of help and support and talking about it. That's why we've decided that the advocacy group we're looking for with NCAN are the millions of adults who've experienced abuse and or neglect as children, have never talked about it and are doing well now and would like, but, <clears throat> but who clearly have um, periods of pain or flashbacks or other things when it reminds them. <laughs> and, we, and we just need to bring this out uh, so that we can address it from the beginning. You definitely answered my next question, um, which was, what do you think we need to do as a society to change the perspective that we have as child abuse mentioned above? So <laughs> you answered my next question again. Um, I, well, we need to talk about it. We just, and, and, you know, for me, the most important group to focus on because they've been ignored I mean, every, all people are important to focus on, uh, but it's the boys. The boys between the ages of three or four or five and 10, uh, who something happens to, either within their family or more often with boys, I think, outside the family. Uh, and they're abused physically, sexually, emotionally, maybe all of them, uh, and they never talk about it. The women's movement in the 1970s uh, had a large impact on bringing sexual abuse into the open, uh, primarily for women. But even now we see with the experiences of men in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, who are abused in the scouts or in churches uh, or on teams or in other settings, they've never talked about it. 
Uh, they may have some alcoholism, they may have periods of depression, uh, but something happens to boys early on that nobody notices and they don't talk about. And I think it's, that's our opportunity for intervention to really make a difference uh, and improve the outcomes for boys and the other boys and women that they will late, later abuse. Yeah, <laughs> that was exactly my next question I had for you was- I um, wish you'd sent me, Danya, the questions so I could know them in advance. I, I sent them to Lindsay. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> she never passed them on to me. <laughs> So I'm, I'm just doing this cold. <laughs> That's okay. Um, Actually, she did pass it on to me, but I've been too busy to go back and read it. <laughs> That's okay. Um, but I think I'm doing okay, I think. Yeah, you're doing great. Um, my next question I had for you was, research has suggested that most abusers were once abused him or herself. What do you think we need to know and to do to change this for the better? Well, first, while it's true that all of the abusers we've ever seen have experienced abuse in their childhood, the public believes also, and I think it contributes to the silence, there's a belief that if you are abused, you will be an abuser. And that's absolutely not true. The majority of abused children uh, will not grow up to be an abuser. They will, do they will do okay. The reasons for that are in part because uh, there are usually other adults in their environment, grandparents, aunts, uncles, teachers, ministers, friends, neighbors, who recognize what's going on and basically give them the message, what's happening to you is not your fault. What's happening to you uh, shouldn't be happening. And if you need me to help and protect you, I'll do that. But you don't need to grow up like that. The abused child who believes that they are a bad child, a bad kid, and the beatings that a parent or step parent did was what they needed to do to make them a good kid are the ones who are likely to repeat the cycle. If you believe that this is the way to love children and care for children, uh, you'll tend to repeat the cycle. The psychiatrist who worked with Henry Kemp, who I worked with also for many years, was a man named Brad Steele. And he described abuse as uh, like a cancer of the soul. Uh, it's treatable, like most cancers. Uh, but for some people, it's not. And it's malignant. And those are the ones that will repeat the cycle. Uh, others it won't happen. Uh, Brandt also said, if you don't understand somebody's behavior, you don't have enough history. So when someone is acting out and you don't understand why they're behaving the way they are, instead of hitting them or screaming at them and telling them to stop, you need to sit down and have a conversation and find out what's going on. It was good advice. I've, I love that cancer for the soul. Um, I've never heard of that. So that's definitely something that I think I'm going to highlight with this interview. I think it's something a lot of people can relate to. Um, and a different perspective that a lot of people don't actually think about when they think about abuse and trauma. Um, well, because we viewed it in such a legalistic uh, way for so long, uh, the instinct is to punish uh, and punish the abuser instead of sitting down and finding out how. Uh, the, the truth is back in the 19, late 60s, 90% of the families who Henry and Brandt 
and the large team they had here in Denver uh, treated when they saw an abused child, uh, never abused the child again, and the child was back with the family within a year if the child had to be placed with someone else for a while. The problem with our child protection system now in the United States, and I think to a certain extent in Canada, um, there's no treatment. There's just identifying cases, uh, labeling people, uh, and there's, there's no real treatment for the child or the family. And there's no long-term follow-up to, to see that if what we did as a system, when we reported them and they were taken on by child welfare, uh, there's no follow-up to know whether that actually helped the family. So that, that's another thing we hope with our foundation is that we can begin to help the field that's working with abused children and their families uh, learn how to be public and honest about our mistakes and ask people, how was the experience working with us? Did we actually make things better or did we make it worse? And how can we make it better? Mm -hmm. I think that point of intervention is so important and the follow-up afterwards would really make a difference in someone's life. Yeah. Um, okay, the next question I have is, why do you think funding for research to help us understand the long-term impacts of maltreatment and current interventions for childhood abuse are so limited? What do you think needs to be done to change this? Well, I think that, you know, we, we believe the model, uh, the model has been in place for 50 years. <clears throat> the United States uh, with the National Institute of Health, uh, Canada with its Medical Research Council, or not, I, I actually don't know the exact name, but there is a research council. Um, the research has been funded for 50 years uh, on practically every affliction that's viewed as a health affliction uh, and things are better. Uh, in, intuitively, uh, looking at what happens to and, and the struggle that our child welfare colleagues have in trying to meet the mandate that we give them of investigating and helping every family uh, that we report to them, uh, intuitively it's not working. And so we have to have approaches. There has been research. I, I don't wanna suggest that the field is exactly where it was back in 1960, it isn't. We now know much more about recognizing abuse than we did before. There is research going on. It's mostly self-funded. There's some wonderful research that's been done on prevention. We know that if we provide someone like a public health nurse home visitor to a pregnant woman with a new baby and uh, she stays with her for the first two years of the baby's life, that over the course of that mother and baby's career, both will do much better and there won't be any abuse in 87% of the cases. Uh, so there are interventions that work, but because we have this social mindset instead of the health mindset, uh, we create a prevention program. And that's a not-for-profit NGO type organization uh, that you have to raise money to sustain. If we know that pro providing home visitation support to families is enormously helpful, why isn't that part of our health system? Just part of the health system. Like this person, you can go get your knee replaced. This person, you need a home visitor because you're four months pregnant. And it's not so easy to go through pregnancy and have a baby. And particularly if you yourself uh, have experienced trauma in your childhood, having help is critical. I know as a pediatrician, there are no new 
mothers and fathers who can't use a lot of good help. Now for most families, that's their own parents. But for a lot of families, their parents are part of the problem, not part of the solution. And they're the ones that we need uh, as a health system and as neighbors uh, to gather around and provide support. So uh, we've, we've, we've got to have more research to understand the impact. We have to understand uh, how best to effectively treat people uh, and help them uh, bring it out in the open. I 100% agree with you um, and that it's preventing it in a way of informing the parents and future parents so that if they have experienced abuse or trauma that they're able to heal that. So it's stopping that intergenerational trauma from being passed down. Right. And it starts with being able to talk about it. Mm -hmm. It really, Which is really why does. we have the phrase louder than silence. Yes, that's very true. The last question I have for you is, why do you think it is important to get more funding for pediatric subspecialists to focus on childhood abuse? What do you think these pediatric subspecialists can do to help break the cycle? Well, that's, that's interesting, Danya, because I, I should tell you that uh, 15 years ago, when the proposal to have a pediatric subspecialist in child abuse was uh, put up before the American Board of Pediatrics, I opposed it. I thought it was a bad idea. Um, and I thought it was a bad idea because there was no NIH research tr or training money to support the subspecialty. It passed anyway, finally, and I, uh, it's here and we have hundreds of child abuse uh, pediatricians, uh, many of whom are my colleagues. But what I've noticed is most of their work maybe 80, 90% of their work uh, is done uh, for prosecutors and the courts and for child welfare to have expert testimony. That's not my vision of what a subspecialty in child abuse should look like. A subspecialty in child abuse should do that. And when I did child abuse work in the 80s, I testified in court a lot. Uh, I testified in the first uh, criminal prosecution of a child abuse death here in Colorado in 1981. But it's got to be more than that. It has to include how do we engage our behavioral health colleagues, the psychologists and psychiatrists and social workers? How do we engage uh, community workers and family support centers and others in creating an environment that can not only treat the abused children and their families so that the children can be back with their families, uh, but we can focus on prevention. And there's practically no prevention work coming out of this subspecialty. And there's very little treatment coming out of the subspecialty. So it's right now all forensic. Um, I'm hopeful that if we can first get the five to 10 million people to sign up with us the way they sign up with um, the uh, Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Uh, and I see these sad looking dogs in shelters every night and uh, being asked to send $19 a month to them uh, or uh, to uh, the children at St. Jude's Hospital who need that as well. If, if the abuse uh, community, those who've experienced it can come together, if we can build the advocacy group, I think NIH and the research will follow. And then the subspecialty will really grow and flourish. But it can't grow and flourish if its only source of revenue uh, is expert testimony. Very interesting. 
I never realized that. Um, so I, I hope that Endkin can do wonders um, in creating this community for survivors and not only just for survivors and people who have experienced it, but then extend that onto all these people who can help everyone else. Uh, yeah, we're, we're only three years old. We're just learning to walk. <laughs> Yep, we're only a, running. yeah, but we're uh, only a but it's it's going well. Uh, we uh, we've got a terrific little team. Lori is a dynamite leader for our group, uh, and we've got a wonderful board of directors that I get to chair. And um, you know, we someday maybe we'll uh, be like the March of Dimes. That would everybody will everybody will understand it. <laughs> that will be amazing one day. Well, I'm just gonna pause the recording for